So my brief today is to talk about concepts in tendon rehabilitation. And you can see from the bottom of this slide that it's not a simple issue, that we have to consider pain, we have to consider function, and we have to consider pathology. And our rehabilitation has to integrate all these things in our approach to the patient to get the outcomes that we need. So when we're making decisions about how we rehabilitate a tendon, we have to make a first decision, is, which is, are we trying to change pathology and, and affect structure? Are we trying to change pain? Well, of course we are, because our patients come to us with pain, and that's our primary outcome measure. But do we want to restore function? Well, the answer to that is, of course, yes, we do, because you can see from the diagram that most of our patients want to be active either at a high level or just recreationally. So function is so important to us. And I want to appeal to you that restoration of function is what we do as physiotherapists, that this is our key core value, and we must never let go of the fact that exercise and functional restoration is what is good for tendons and good for many of the conditions that Emma has alluded to today. So before we can actually get on to understanding pain and function, I want to just run through some issues about pathology and, and, and structural change. And today, in 2017, we still don't fully understand what happens in, how, in pathology and how a tendon develops it. So inflammation, we used to think, was an issue, but in the 80s and 90s, we thought that that had gone away, but it is making a comeback, so there is now research groups that suggest inflammation is a key factor. Collagen tearing was what I learned, that when you went out for a run, you actually overstretched your tendon and you tore your collagen. So that was um, something that was in the 70s and, and again is carried through to today. And of course, Craig and I developed the continuum model where we think that the cell is key to um, the development of pathology and how we see symptoms in tendons. And I will talk through that um, as we move through the, the presentation. So if we look at how we develop tendon, off, uh, tendon pathology, we know that there is some inflammation in tendons, that there are inflammatory cells and there are inflammatory mediators, so we have to consider that. From a collagen tearing perspective, I think we can finally say that that does not happen. So you cannot tear normal collagen. If you have a muscle tendon bone continuum and you overstretch it, your vulnerable vulnerable parts or your vulnerable tissues are the muscle and the bone. The tendon is so strong that you can never ever tear normal collagen. So that is not the starting point of tendon pathology. And the cell-based model that we talked about is where the cells are intimately connected to the, the collagen matrix. They can sense load and they respond to load. And this is a really important uh, way of thinking about Again, how load and function can influence our outcomes. So if we put that together, what we can talk about is that inflammation exists, but it's not our prime driver of pathology. Collagen tearing exists, but it's a consequence of a pathological state, so it's not the primary event. And that our cell changes exist and seem to be driving much of our pathology and uh, the changes we see in the tendon. And you might say to me, well, I actually don't care what's happening in my tendons because I'm interested in treating my patient and their pain and, and, and hopefully their function. But I'm going to tell you that we should be thinking about it because pathology should help us direct um, rehabilitation. So if we're talking about inflammation, our primary um, intervention is rest because we want the inflammation to settle. If we're talking about collagen tearing, our primary intervention is rest because we want the collagen to heal. But this is where we get into trouble because we know that rest is bad for tendons. Tendons must have load on them virtually every day to maintain structure. So we know that we can't approach our tendons from an inflammation or collagen tearing perspective. But if we think about the cell being the key driver of tendon pathology, we know that 
the cell is responsive to load, and that allows us to use loading and restoring function as the key treatment in um, tendons. And we can do it with uh, the understanding that we, we are helping the tendon, that the load is beneficial for a tendon. But all, even with all of this knowledge, can we change pathology once it's developed? Well, I hate to share with you the fact that it doesn't appear that once we have a degenerative pathology that we can actually change it. So any exercise-based intervention, and the graph that you can see up here is a 24-week program of, of exercise, and you can see that the structure does not change. These people get better, they become more functional, they lose their pain but our structure doesn't change. So it appears that almost nothing we do will change structure. So that leads us to the question, do we need to change structure? And this is some very exciting work that is so important to us as physiotherapists that Sean Docking has um, done as part of his postdoctoral research at La Trobe. So he looked at normal and pathological Achilles and patella tendons, and here's a normal tendon. This is some special imaging that we use that helps us um, measure how much structure is in tendons. And here's a pathological tendon, and these are both patella tendons. This red part here is the, patholo the pathology within the tendon. And he showed that the pathological tendon is thicker. Well, we know that clinically. We see thick tendons in, um, uh, in our patients. He also showed that a pathological tendon has more pathology than a normal tendon. Well, again, you're going to sort of kick me off stage and say, well, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> I know, that's nothing new particularly. But this is the most exciting thing that he showed. When he looked at how much good structure there was, and the green and blue represent good structure, he showed that in both the Achilles and the patella tendon, the pathological tendon had more good structure than the normal tendon. Let me repeat that. The pathological tendon has more good structure than a normal tendon. This means for us that we can load these tendons because we have plenty of good tissue. We do not have to tell our patients, oh my goodness, you have pathology, we must be so careful. We can't put too much load on it because it might rupture and we might make you worse. The answer is, that is not true. That tendon pathology causes the tendon to adapt and develop much more tissue that can take load. So here we go again. We're physiotherapists. Loading is what we do. Exercise is what we do. And we have a tendon that can take load and will benefit from load. So this is so important. And here it is in, in another way. And what you can see, if this is the range of normal tendon cross-sectional area, and these are the patella tendons that had pathology, all of them but one had as much tendon structure, good tendon structure as a normal tendon, or in cases, some cases had a lot more. Now, what Sean says, number one, you do not need to worry about the tendon pathology. Number two, you can tell your patients, treat the donut, not the hole. This is really important. So, the hole is the pathology. We don't have to worry about that. We don't eat the hole. It's not important to us. We have plenty of donut that we can load. And this is so important for our, for our patients to understand because we see so many of them who are frightened to load because they've been told they have a tendon tear or they you know, have um, uh, great areas of degeneration. And it can be quite frightening for them. And you can undo that by telling them that that's not true. So if we leave structure now and look at where pain comes from, it's really important to understand that the hole in the donut, our pathology, is not the driver of pain. So we can have a tendon that looks really disrupted on ultrasound imaging, and this is a patella tendon, but this person can be completely pain-free. So it's not the amount of vascularity, it's not the amount of echogenicity within the tendon that causes pain. In fact, if I took an ultrasound to all of you, I would find that 25% of you had tendon pathology somewhere and you have never had pain. So we know pain doesn't come from the poor structure or the pathology. But we don't know the source of pain. And this is a real problem for us because how do we treat it if we don't know where the pain is coming from? What we do know and what is so important in this um, new area of pain in the brain is that lower limb tendon pain 
does not appear to be centrally sensitised. It appears to be a local nociceptive issue. That is, the, ten the tendon is the source of the pain and the uh, source of nociception and the, the pain in the brain is actually from the tendon. So what do we do about the pain? Well, we know that the nerves in the tendons are in the periphery. That is, they are in the peritendon. There are no nerves deep in the tendon. And in, in pathology, any nerves that grow in are actually um, sympathetic, not sensory. That is, they control the blood vessels, that they don't actually have the ability to, uh, to send pain. So if we are going to treat pain, what we have to do is direct treatments at the nerves. And that will allow us to gain some sort of pain control by inducing damage to the nerves, a new, what we would call a neuropraxia. The problem with this is it's only short term and it lasts days, perhaps out to months. And the examples of treatments that will give us pain relief, but only because they work on the nerves and not function and not structure, are things like shockwave therapy, our filleting surgeries, and our polydocanal, our sclerosing therapies, all of which have been shown to be successful, but probably because they directly treat the nerves, not the function and not the structure that we've talked about before. So what's the link between pain and dysfunction? It's, it's, this is the biggest link of everything we're talking about today. Tendon pain causes profound dysfunction. So tendon pain affects your ability to be active. It affects your ability um, to perform if you're a sports person. And this is one of our football players who came to us in May of a season, so a couple of months into the season. By that stage, he'd had 17 injections across a variety of injuries. And he said, I've had a fractured finger. I can play. I've had low back pain. I can play. I have had a sprained ankle. I can play. But I cannot play with my tendon pain because it stops me. It stops me changing direction, stops me jumping, and I need to do something about this. So the relationship between pain and function is so important, and it's what we aim to, the, the nexus that we aim to disrupt with our physiotherapy. So as physical therapists, do we consider function? And I would argue that we probably don't very much. We think very much about pain and structure, and we don't think about function. So what loads, if we are going to use function to restore people back to pain-free activity, what loads do we need to consider? Well, the tendon has a lot of load placed on it. It has energy storage loads, and that's when it acts like a spring. It has compressive loads, so tendons get compressed against bone just before they insert. This is an Achilles tendon. We get compressive loads at outer range. Of, of movement, and we get friction loads between the tendon and the surrounding tissues where we get a peritendon problem. We will talk about these all this afternoon when we talk about Achilles tendinopathy. But I just want to highlight that in the Achilles, we see all of these loads at different places in the tendon. So we see a lot of energy storage overload in the mid tendon where the tendon is overloaded in its spring like behavior. We see too, too, many compre too much compressive load at the insertion, so we get pathology down there by loading it into dorsiflexion, and we see peritendon problems where we see friction loads between the tendon and the, um, the surrounding structures. So even in one tendon, we have to consider three different sort of loads to restore function. So if we look at function, how do, do we find, how do we define it? It must be related to maximum tendon function. And Craig and Ebony are both going to talk about this graph. And what it shows is that to really restore function in tendons, we must do very fast loading at some point in our rehabilitation, that we can't just do slow loading. We must get this tendon able to take very, very fast loads. And that's what allows us to use our tendon as a spring, which is our energy storage loads that we talked about previously. And we also must allow the tendon to deal with compressive loads and how we integrate that into a rehabilitation program, I will show you. So what we need to do is restore the tendon back to the highest level of function that we can, but we can't just concentrate on the tendon. We have to concentrate on the muscle that's attached to the tendon. We have to con concentrate on restoring function in the kinetic chain, and we have to concentrate, and Ebony will talk about, restoring brain function as well. 
But what I can tell you, and if I want to give you a take-home message from today, that a person who has poor function will nearly always have persistent tendon pain. And if we restore function, we will get rid of that person's pain. And we restore function by progressively loading a tendon with exercise and ensuring that we get the right loads on a tendon. So if we have a look at what rehabilitation protocols are out there with evidence, the eccentric protocol, you know the Alfredson program and a, a few other programs, it, this program loads the tendon, loads the spring in a slow way. So it puts load on the series elastic component in the tendon. What it doesn't do is strengthen the muscle attached to the tendon. It doesn't strengthen the kinetic chain and it doesn't change the brain. So we don't get any adaptation to those fast loads that we so desperately need in tendons and we get no adaptation to the compressive loads that we see at insertional tendinopathies. There's also heavy slow resistance that has some evidence that gives us muscle strength and gives us some load on the tendon and there is some evidence that slow heavy loading increases mechanical strength of tendon but it also fails to deliver us the energy storage loads, the faster spring-like loads we need. It doesn't deliver us tolerance to compressive loads, and it doesn't address our kinetic chain and brain. So even though these have the most evidence, they fail us when we're trying to return our athlete back to sport. One of the issues is that all of these protocols have a surrogate outcome measure of reducing pain. They never investigate whether that person is actually able to return to sport, which is a, there's a big gap between having less pain in your tendon and actually being able to be active. So what do they have in common? They have exercise in common and correct loading, and that's what we need to be doing. Why can't we get our patients to adhere to exercise programs? Because we've been telling them for years to exercise and they think you're just telling them the same thing. It takes time to do this. And also, I think, because it's not expensive. You know, I think if we charged $1,000 per exercise, we would get much more adherence because people expect that expensive treatments will have an effect. And they are more likely to do their exercises because they've paid $1,000 for your exercise program. Of course, we won't. But there are reasons why exercise is hard to get patients to do. So how do we make exercise ideal for tendons? We make the tendon, the muscle tendon complex and the kinetic chain tolerant to our loads, so pain will improve. We don't try and change structure and we don't rely on quick fixes because we get short-term gain and no long-term outcomes. So how do we do it? We do a stage loading program. First, we reduce our loads to let the tendon settle down and then we gradually reload our tendon. And this is our cartoon to say that we take what they can currently do and in very small steps, we go through a strength, energy storage and energy storage release program back to our required capacity. And we add endurance and compression loads at the same time. And so we will talk the rest of the day about our four stages. Our four stages are stage one isometrics to reduce pain. We do this outside of compression. Our stage two is strength, where we look at muscle and kinetic chain strength, functional strength and strength endurance without compression. Stage three is restoring faster programs, where we add end of range eccentric loading and we start to add compression. And stage four is um, sports specific loading, where we need to add compressive loads. So we take that stage program and we fit it to the person and the tendon. The first thing is that individuals differ markedly. So we have elite jumping athletes and we have sedentary people um, who don't do very much activity. Um, and so our rehabilitation must be different. Our tendons vary markedly, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, how our patella tendon and our Achilles tendon are actually very different. But our gluteal tendon is a disease of postmenopausal women, whereas our Achilles tendon can occur across the lifespan. So what about rest? It's a disaster. Do not rest tendons. The tendon turns to, uh, loses its structure. We lose musculotendinous strength. We lose kinetic chain function and we get changes in our brain. So we get a massive unloading effect. And we know that the strength of a tissue will only be as great as the load that we place on it. So what about interventions? We know there are many interventions and many electrotherapies and a lot of guru juice that flows around and I'm going to fix your tendon. My take on it 
is if you have poor function, it really doesn't ma matter what intervention you do. Unless you restore function, you will still hop like a duck. And that's what we see in our athletes, people with really poor function. So can interventions be negative? Yes, they can. So this shows an injection into a tendon. That's 16 months post-injection. Here's the response of a tendon to a saline and a PRP injection with cells and proteoglycans. And you think PRP is good until you look at normal. In fact, PRP is worse for the tendon. And if you look at what happens to our collagen, you can see that nothing changes. So our injection therapies don't offer us very much. And this is a case study. I love this. This is a lady who had a massive vascular response after a polydocanal injection. And you probably can't read these. But this is where she had a polydocanal. And after that, she, had offered, she was offered iontophoresis, shockwave, a corticosteroid injection, acupuncture, and surgery. So even with this sort of negative response, she had massive interventions in that tendon, when a, whereas a loading program might have helped. What about the things that you do? I don't care what you do. I don't care if you use massage and ice and taping and electrotherapy as long as you do the loading program. You cannot replace the loading program with hands-on therapies because you will be unsuccessful. So in summary, tendons and tendon pathology in pain is complex and they're often managed far too simplistically. Recipe treatments don't work because they don't address the individual, they don't address the tendon, and they don't fully restore function. And you are the clinicians. You have to be thoughtful. You have to really understand what's happening in tendons so that you can fully rehabilitate them. Thank you so much.